Hello, uh, dear friends, uh, you're all welcome to the uh, webinar series uh, organized um, on the topic theme, um, Ambedkar and the Agenda for Nation Building. This course is designed and offered by uh, uh, Professor P.D. Satipal Kumar, sir. Um, he's a senior professor at the Department of Anthropology, Andhra University, Andhra Pradesh. So this uh, course uh, uh, is organized by uh, International Institute of uh, Anthropological Applications, which is a virtual institute of uh, Anthropological Association for Humankind. Um, today, uh, we have our speaker ready uh, to deliver his lecture. Um, so I request Professor uh, Satipal Kumar, sir, to deliver his lecture. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Pedrataya and also uh, uh, participants in this particular uh, uh, lecture series today. Uh, friends, uh, this is the sixth, uh, uh, say, talk in this series. And uh, this particular uh, talk covers on the topic called as the ideology of exclusion and the cultural politics in Indian society. So friends, we have seen uh, five different facets in the previous uh, kind of a sort of a, a talks like uh, we looked into the cultural capital we also have looked into the caste based mode of production and enforced poverty and uh, we are trying to look into different dimensions actually like in a sense uh, uh, the, the, the preceding one is on the cultural foundations of uh, structural violence in india actually so today we look into from the overt uh, say kind of uh, expressions into a kind of a, a covert and ideological uh, sort of base actually so my argument today basically is that the ideology behind uh, this social structure itself is an exclusionary ideology and i'm basing my arguments of course on uh, dr ambedkar and his uh, uh, like in a sense, uh, incisive writings on Indian society. And uh, when we talk about exclusion, uh, friends, the concept of exclusion uh, has been recent. Earlier, uh, the concept of exclusion, those things that we are talking uh, related to this concept of exclusion, basically people who are talking about the social discrimination uh, or discrim I mean, deprivation, and uh, such kind of a terminology uh, used to be there. But uh, yeah, we know like uh, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, right from uh, 1999 and all, we have seen this concept of uh, social exclusion has been brought in to couch different uh, aspects of uh, deprivation and also to bring in several, in fact, no untouched areas uh, hitherto in the, uh, say, uh, discussion of social sciences. So this concept, actually, of social exclusion, it has made a rapid ascent. Or uh, Now, today, it has become a central you know, debate on deprivation. Uh, one of the, you know, like in a sense, uh, social scientists on uh, exclusion, Flirt, he explains that the emphasis began to shift from the analysis of income poverty to broader multidimensional aspects of exclusion, looking not just the number of deprivations individually, but at the links between them. So therefore, the relationships between uh, the multiple deprivations, basically, not just how they operate, but what are exactly their links between them. So that has been uh, uh, the concept of uh, exclusion which thoroughly, in fact, relates to Ambedkar's analysis. Uh, we understand that, uh, that Ambedkar was the first ever social scientist who have looked at the caste system, not just as a social aberration, but he was the first among the many social scientists to, to actually unveil the economic exploitation within the caste system. And then, of course, like in a sense, other forms of uh, relational aspects. So therefore, this concept's advantage, as argued by 
another uh, so no authority and social exclusion arjun dihan that the concept focuses attention on crucial aspects of deprivation as the consequence of unequal social relations providing a holistic holistic understanding of the society and it has very clear implications for policies so therefore when uh, arjun dihan talk talk about the unequal relationships in fact no and uh, uh, the holistic understanding probably we will see that he is almost in fact no uh, touching upon dr ambedkar if not taking dr ambedkar's name actually uh, practically but uh, as we see their analysis actually uh, either clerk or naila kabir or arjun dihan and many of these bills and have you know pfizer many of these people like in a sense who worked on social exclusion their premise has been the kind of an ap approach and perspective which dr ambedkar uh, uh, you know in this uh, you know like 1930s and 40s have utilized in exposing or expounding the indian society so sukhdev torat as we know uh, finds that caste based exclusion in india resulted in the most severe and intensely discriminative form of deprivation he says the varna caste system also known as brahmanical system implies a forced exclusion of one caste from the rights of other castes in all spheres of life and a regulatory mechanism to enforce several instruments of social ostracism built within it actually so this part of it actually like in a sense as who are uh, like in a sense uh, uh, from the social science background could very easily like uh, understand if at all we are into the literature of caste and its analysis we know that this mechanism of enforcement has been in fact no integrally uh, say couched so and we see that uh, this brahmanical in fact no system of uh, exclusion it is a majority exclusion where a few privileged uh, so no castes enjoy absolute rights and majority castes are denied equal privileges and basic human rights actually so this is uh, very well known so it's a forced exclusion and it's a majority exclusion and if you look at the third facet of it what we look into is this system is a group based exclusion so why i am saying that it is a group based discussion because the focus of exclusion is the social group and not the individual it is this is what ambedkar in fact 1936 he maintains that caste system does not recognize the individual and his or her distinctiveness as the center of social purpose ambedkar says there is no uh, what you call a uh, uh, credibility for an individual here individuals in fact no uh, what you call capacities capabilities they doesn't matter in fact in fixing up a person's uh, say uh, like uh, uh, say uh, category of uh, putting the, uh, a person into a category where somebody is respected or not there is no place for the individual actually so therefore for the purpose of rights and duties even the family is not regarded as a unit in this society except for purpose of marriage and inheritance so except for these two purposes marriage and inheritance family also doesn't come into play the primary unit here is caste and hence the rights and privileges or lack of them for, for an individual flow from the membership of a particular caste so therefore the group basically becomes very very important uh, in uh, like ascertaining or providing a kind of a, a privilege a rights or in fact any kind of opportunities uh, to an individual so it doesn't recognize individual it doesn't even recognize a family except for uh, as a kind of you know commensal relationships and all but it is always the group the caste which is more important the caste to which an individual uh, say belongs decides the respective rights or the social status or the privileges that one can enjoy so therefore this is a group based exclusion so and uh, as a uh, fraser another rasano uh, scholar on exclusion says he provides a spectrum of uh, justice in fact in the exclusionary uh, say relationships he is a spectrum of uh, like in a sense uh, injustice 
it stretches from primary economic forms at one end and to primarily cultural forms on the other so he says that uh, exclusion in fact no like in a sense it oscillates between on the on one pole you have deprivation from economic aspects and on the other side which bases on the cultural lesson or uh, say factors so caste in india becomes in fact no a bivalent collectivity this is what fraser and also neila kabir show caste in india in fact no it belongs to both the ends both from the economic deprivations as well as cultural you know, deprivations so therefore they they in fact you now present caste as a bivalent collectivity so the economic disadvantage in the caste system is rooted in the religiously sanctioned uh, segregation and ordering of uh, occupations with the lowest castes obviously associated with the most stigmatized occupations nayak another you know, uh, 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 scholar worked on exclusion in india finds that caste embodies various forms of symbolic devaluations which serve to define the lowest caste as the despised category or having no caste at all and to legitimate various forms of injustice including physical uh, harm so where he says jabson you know, nayak says there are series of uh, symbolic devaluations uh, which of course like in the sense which have been attached uh, to an individual from this uh, group certain groups in fact now which have been arranged at the lower rungs of the uh, so no caste hierarchy so he says that like the symbolic devaluations even go to the extent of despising an individual or in fact now resulting in a behavior which causes a physical harm so friends understanding deprivation from an exclusionary perspective and uh, the social institutions attached with that the processes of operation the relationship of power and ideology here it becomes very very uh, say critical so therefore let us see how these you know scholars on uh, social exclusion try to premise their uh, their analysis actually so that premise in fact now we will try to see with few uh, you know of these uh, uh, scholars who worked on uh, social exclusion actually bell and pyron they define social exclusion as a systematic disadvantage and is founded on social relations which is concerned with the excluded as well the, as well as the excluder thereby putting power at the center of analysis so they say that in fact no uh, social exclusion is a feature of social structure of societies in which recurrent patterns of uh, social relationships deny individuals and groups access to goods services activities resources which are associated with general citizenship so therefore for bill and pyron their center of analysis is the relationships of power actually similarly estville in 2003 he goes add, adds another dimension to the aspect of power he presents social exclusion as an accumulation of confluent processes with successive ruptures arising from the heart of economy politics and society gradually distances places persons groups communities and territories in positions of inferiority in relations to the center of power resource and prevailing values so he was adding in fact now uh, additional two factors of uh, uh, resources control over resources access to resources rather and then prevailing values of the society to the analysis of power then if you move in fact now to other uh, social exclusion experts like uh, silver k of jalal and then of course you know these people they explain social exclusion uh, as a process and a state that prevents individuals or groups from full participation in social economic and political life and from asserting their rights so it derives from uh, the exclusionary relationships based on power so here we have another dimension called as the exclusionary relationships actually based on different factors now if you look at uh, another you know kind of uh, uh, say uh, explanation which further gets into the side of the culture actually uh, bakrash and uh, bartas 
uh, say they both in 2000 assert that the institutional rules and norms spell out particular patterns of exclusion whereby predominant sets of values, beliefs, rituals, and institutional procedures that operate systematically and consistently to benefit certain persons and groups at the expenses of expense of others. And those who benefit are placed in a preferred position to defend and promote their vested interests. So therefore, here, the, the kind of an analysis, in fact, no, the, 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 the basis of analysis moves from a power, power to access to resources, and then prevailing values, then to the exclusion relationships. Now we'll see that it moves towards uh, the cultural aspects of uh, values, beliefs, and rituals, and institutional procedures. Now we'll see Amartya Sen in 2004, he finds that the relational roots of deprivation and focus on the actors and the processes. So Sen clearly looks into the operational paradigm actually, the actors and the processes, which he says that it is important in the analysis of exclusion. So he says that in order to get a holistic understanding of exclusion, then we have another Arjun Dihan. He suggests in 2008 and 2010 that economic, political, and cultural processes of, of a society are required to be interpreted in terms of deprivation and as much of identity and ideology of such condition. So here he moves completely into the identity and then ideology of a society or a social structure which couches these uh, relationships of uh, uh, exclusionary you know, positions and all. So now we will uh, we have uh, the aspect of in fact like the interface between ideology and social order. We need to look into that particular aspect. So in the, in the interface between this in the ideology and uh, social order reveals a nature of exclusion intrinsic to caste system. That is exactly what Ambedkar says. See, the uh, aspects of identity basically makes a very, very important aspect over here. Ambedkar anal analyzes, in fact, no, identities of supplication and uh, identities of assertion in the analysis of articulation of identities in the caste society. I'm not going into that aspect, actually. We'll deal with identities a little, little later. But uh, he, will, he was talking very clearly about the ideology. And Ambedkar says, fundamentally, the Brahminical ideology is it bases on the concept of natural inequality. That's what he says. So he, he explains that elements of Brahminical cosmology proclaim inequalities to be built into the very nature of categories, such as natural objects, foods, occupation, people, and even gods themselves. This concept of natural inequality, it in fact, no, it's almost like a software. If you look at it from that particular perspective, everything, the nature, like in a sense, uh, the typology of foods we see, which are valued based on sacred and profane, and you have occupations, then people, and even supernaturals, in fact, no, are categorized as high and low. So Ambedkar says that this concept of natural inequality has been crucial for the Brahminical system to look at everything and to treat everything inequally. So he says that untouchability becomes only a logical corollary of this understanding of nature, God, and human agency, bound to together by the concept of purity, pollution, and the law of karma. We pretty well know about this particular thing. So therefore, friends, it can be understood that Brahminical ideology is an ideology of exclusion which molded the social order based on inequality, where we find no two castes are equal and the divided castes are made to oppose each other. We have looked into the psychology of caste, actually. So the psychology of caste, in fact, now what we have understood previously was uh, that if you look into the definition that way, it says that caste is a device designed to divide. It's like a tool whose function basically is to divide it never unites basically so therefore uh, and the divided caste basically are made to uh, so no, antagonize each other that has been the very nature of the system that we have already seen now we will see friends the forms of exclusion which are there in the exclusionary uh, so no, perspective 
and couch them with the Brahminical system that we have in India. So Amartya Sen, again, uh, presents various forms of exclusion, which are distinguishable depending upon the nature and context of exclusion. So Sen, Amartya Sen, in fact, now brings up uh, almost five different types of exclusion. He calls them as ex active exclusion, passive exclusion, living mode exclusion, constitutive relevance of exclusion, and the unfavorable inclusion. See, there are the five categories that he types, the typology of exclusion that he presents. So therefore, Brahminical system can be related to all forms of exclusion. This is one specific and a peculiar you know, uh, uh, pattern of Brahminical system. It, it, it relates to all form of, forms of these exclusion. That's why Amartya Sen says it is a kind of a holistic exclusion, rather. So let us see. What... Uh, uh, sir, could you please uh, mute uh, the presentation? Yeah. So what is active exclusion? Active exclusion, in fact, now is fostering of exclusion on some groups from equal opportunity through deliberate means. So it is overt form, in fact, no, of exclusion, uh, excluding somebody. So we know castes are overt forms of exclusion. At the same time, there is the second type is called as passive exclusion. Amartya Sen explains this type of exclusion as which as that which results from a set of circumstances. So caste-based exclusion is essentially structural in nature, comprehensive and multiple in coverage. The system denies the rights to ex existential dignity, which, re which regulates human beings to the level of subhuman existence. So the first ever, like in a sense, uh, uh, denial that the system shows is the denial to the right of uh, right to ex existential dignity. So it considers that uh, some groups basically are not equal human beings, but they are subhuman beings. So there are other, in fact, no, like in a sense, entailing denial of rights. So denial of right to identity, denial of claim over resources, denial of choice of, in fact, no occupations. So the line goes on, actually. So that's why Amartya Sen says the Brahminical system, in fact, no, denies the right to existential dignity, which, in fact, no, denies other consequential denial of rights, actually. So that is uh, the second type. Now we'll see the third type which Amar, uh, of Amartya Sen's categorization. That's what is called as a living mode exclusion. It reflects the inability of the individual and groups to interact freely and productively with others and take part in full economic, social, and political life of a community. So living mode exclusion basically, it uh, denies the uh, equal participation in the spheres of uh, Sano, uh, life actually. It is too well known that caste system is infested with the spirit of isolation. And Ambedkar says it is the spirit of isolation. In fact, it makes isolation one of the ca of one caste from another caste makes it a matter of great virtue. So this caste system, basically, like in a sense, it differentiates uh, another caste and uh, considered that it's a great virtue. So that is how, like in a sense, and it also prevents one caste from full participation in the social, economic, political, and the religious life as par with other uh, you know, caste groups. That itself is, in fact, now the what you call a differentiation or exclusionary tendencies within the caste system, which Dr. Ambedkar calls it as the spirit of isolation of one community from the rest of the communities in the matters of this life. So during Ambedkar times, I think so, like in a sense, this, uh, what do you call, uh, the terminology of uh, social exclusion was not there. But Ambedkar tried to explain it with uh, another terminology called as the spirit of isolation, actually, as a matter of, which makes as a matter of virtue. See, like uh, the, the fourth uh, type of uh, exclusion that Amartya Sen uh, refers to is the constitutive relevance of exclusion. What does it indicate? It arises, in fact, due to the inability of excluded group to relate others and take part in the life of the community, which can directly impoverish the members of these groups. This is exactly what we have seen uh, when we discussed uh, 
enforced poverty in the caste mode uh, caste based mode of production as ambedkar explains that caste system and its mode of uh, production basically it results not just in poverty of the you know, lower groups but it creates an enforced poverty actually which of course is called as backwardness which ambedkar in fact not defined it as backwardness what we have seen it at length in fact now i think so it is topic 3 so here amartya sen calls that particular situation as constitutive relevance of exclusion he says that i repeat the inability of the excluded group to relate to others and take part in the life of the community which can directly impoverish the members of the group actually so of course well, let's refer back to ambedkar he says that the caste system permits economic exploitation without obligation it's not just not only a system of unmitigated economic exploitation but it's a system of uncontrolled exploitation it is not just unmitigated but it is uncontrolled rather if you can expand it to it is in fact now it can be explained as a trans generational exploitation economic exploitation it goes beyond in fact of from one generation to another generation and such exploitation in fact now is reinforced is rationalized i think so we'll come back to that part of how exploitation is rationalized how loot of uh, services loot of in fact now statuses is considered as a kind of a matter of virtue so this is the, the final uh, kind of an exclusion in the category that amartya sen um, shows us uh, as a exclusion category is it is called as unfavorable inclusion this is his fifth category he says that it results in a situation where some people are included on deeply unfavorable terms which results in exploitative conditions of services and unequal terms of social participation that is adverse participation so this is what like in a sense of, can be explained saying that all the uh, say what do you call uh, 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 classifications that if you look into purity or uh, category purity or pollution or gradation of occupation or in fact no everything that is attached with the so called lower caste they definitely in fact no are lowly polluting mean and to the sub subhuman existence so this is in fact no what uh, uh, say uh, amartya sen calls this as unfavorable inclusion that means those who are considered as low lower in the system in the caste system everything that they are attached to has been considered as lowly mean and subhuman so therefore this is an unfavorable kind of a attachment or inclusion in that particular category actually so these are in fact now the, the five different categories that uh, are five different forms of exclusion uh, as uh, amartya sen shows us and if you try to relate the brahmanical system to this naturally like in a sense uh, uh, dr ambedkar shows it fits into almost all these aspects and amartya sen himself says uh, caste as a category of exclusion it relates to all the types of uh, sort of category which no other type anywhere in fact no in the world uh, doesn't have this kind of a applicability now we'll turn to kabir kabir's categorization in fact no of privileged inclusion and secondary inclusion among others he, he says that uh, it brings into focus the actors in relation to exclusion and inclusion here she brings in two kinds of uh, categories one is called as privileged insiders and uh, in fact no like uh, if there is a privileged ins insider then you have secondary ins insiders so she brings in two kinds of uh, categories in this she says that privileged ins insiders are those who occupy the central positions within the mainstream of institutions of a society whose collective influence shapes the framework of rules and norms within which all key decisions of social life are made so these privileged institutions in fact no attach to all the privileges and they form and also you so know uh, like uh, support such institutions which maintain that such that such kind of such kind of privilege to them so the secondary insiders in fact no as naila kabir you so know they says they occupy a mere peripheral position in relation to this group 
but they nevertheless enjoy this some of their privileges they try to come up in the privilege actually so here she was trying to talk about something which is almost in fact no equal into the concept of social mobility they try to in fact no uh, say cross these hurdles with a, some kind of an effort actually so friends this is how like we have seen in fact no uh, how the brahmanical system basically is an ideal ideology of exclusion and all the types of exclusion basically relate to this particular system now let us see the second part of it actually which i call it as the cultural politics of exclusion in indian society so we try to look into that particular thing i would like to i have in fact now here uh, brought michel foco here because michel foco uh, he he brought in that kind of an analysis where we can understand in fact now in a form of exclusion how the major elements of power and discourse they play a very very important part of it actually so uh, i will try to in fact now look into the analysis of power and discourse as explained by michel foucault in understanding power relations foucault employs the analysis of the operation of power through discursive regimes this is what he says the discursive regimes institutional dimensions and discourses and understanding how the mechanisms of power are invested colonized utilized involuted transformed displaced and ex extended unquote this is what in fact no 1970s uh, when uh, in the in the discourse of post modernism jacques derrida and then michel foucault they bring in and especially michel foucault goes to the analysis of uh, power here he says that in fact no it's not just power the powerful people in the society they mediate certain discourses which rationalize their as uh, existence of power so therefore that's how like in the sense these institutions and discussions discursive regimes they try to in fact no propel these uh, mechanisms of uh, power through which they are invested colonized utilized involuted and he says transformed and even displaced to continue the sim similar kind of in fact no uh, say advantage of power on the side group focus says again certain groups establish their control over others through power of discourse this is uh, the central lesson in fact no uh, contention the he says that the power of the discourse maintains their privileged position by constantly mediating specific discourses at any given time there will be several discourses and narratives operating in the society i think so we are pretty well in fact now uh, in touch with the narratives the meta narratives and grand narratives that are in fact now uh, like uh, uh, like circulated in the popular discourse see the kind of a brahmical ideology and also in fact now the religious sanction the divine sanction basically has been a high as you know like in the sense what what we call as a grand narrative in the uh, sana varna caste society there is a narrative which talks about in fact no there is a divine sanction there is a theory of uh, karma and then in fact no the consent of in fact no people and all and several different narratives in fact no support and also in fact no strengthen and rationalize this kind of an uh, so no uh, the equal as uh, so no power so narratives uh, friends you uh, so know like are very very crucial in maintaining an unequal relationship actually so that is exactly what uh, foucault later on says in the post modernism we say that there is not just one narrative which is can be called as a grand there are polyphony of narratives actually there are many narratives and each each narrative has its own kind of a setup so that is what uh, so now we try to again see uh if you if we look into another anthropologist american anthropologist who studied in india uh she is uh, joan mencher joan mencher actually wants to wants to actually uh reverse the kind of a view which uh, louis dumo tried to do louis dumo actually wants to look uh, look at the society from top to you uh, know bottom whereas joan mencher says a view from below actually she wants to look at into the so called lower caste and try to understand their narratives their you know like discourses which in fact you know, are projected to deny all the lower you know, attachment of lower or subhuman to them 
so this is exactly in fact now we see here of course ambedkar was in a broad brings these uh, things into the play when he was talking about in two or three of his uh, you know uh, say writings in annihilation of caste of course he brings in the narratives from the uh, say lower ranks of the society and which he debases which he says that they debase they not just debase they counter they just it's not just stop it countering they heckle the kind of uh, discourses which are projected are propagated by the so called higher caste in uh, in uh, in in fact no uh, attaching uh, the kind of lowliness to the lower caste they don't accept of course later on you have uh, another person in uh, anthropologist who looked it from a different dimension that is michel moffat michel moffat in fact no he ways goes to the another analysis says the lower caste do not reject but his contention is they replicate they have they go for a consensus but they try to replicate within that particular uh, system and all so this is another kind of analysis but the, uh, i would like to you know bring up on here again to the the the, the articulation of power and discourse uh, from the perspective that michel foucault explained which comes very close to dr ambedkar says in fact no uh, understanding of uh, caste society so therefore friends uh, at any given time there will be several narratives in fact no discourses operating in the society due to their affiliation and common interests with power certain discourses become privileged and prioritized over others and uh, it also in fact not goes to the process of marginalizing some other discourses and sometimes even erasing some other discourses the mediators of power glamorize and legitimize a particular discourse as the crucial and authoritative discourse so that the operation of operations of power continue to exploit the masses for their own ends so this is how like in a sense uh, michel foucault explains about the power uh, of discourse and the importance of discourse how those in fact now who try to project themselves at the higher levels higher echelons of the social order they mediate certain discourses and also in fact now sideline they try to you know uh, rather look down and then devalue other kind of uh, say narratives so if you couch that to the brahmanical you know system the power of brahmanical discourse operates at different levels to rationalize the exclusion of majority caste in this country the priority in this scheme is to legitimize an unnatural social order that is exactly what we have been talking about the caste system is an unnatural uh, you know system whereby if minority in fact no like in a sense uh, takes all the privileges at the cost of the majority which itself is unnatural so therefore to rationalize to 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 uh, you know like maintain this kind of an order there is you know uh, the necessity of many discourses particularly in fact no the religious kind of a discourses so therefore religion is employed as the powerful medium of discourses justifying inequality as a natural phenomena with a divine seal and in this process multiple discourses in india like folk tribal and other wide world views are marginalized and uh, can be debased only by in fact no uh, they have been debased and uh, in the process in fact no yeah sanskrit in fact no has been established as a coded language and we know this kind of a uh, discourse and language we understand that particular thing how sanskrit in fact now has been elevated at the cost of other uh, so kind of a native kind of a languages stylized and mythicized as the language of gods sanskrit which is never a people's language has been accessible only to the brahmin and the religious texts reveal that through mantras spelled in sanskrit the brahmin appropriates himself as the controller over gods and as lord on earth that is bhudeva uh, we don't have to explain this particular thing it's quite as uh, you know uh, clear because it is uh, so the discourse has been presented as sanskrit sanskrit as the language of the god gods actually and god gods understand only this language and this language is the prerogative of only the brahmin because sanskrit in fact now like in a sense or even education uh, has been uh, uh, you know uh, dubbed as in fact now ban on the majority so therefore this discourse that sanskrit 
has been as the language of the gods and only a brahmin can in fact know like uh, interact with the god uh, appropriate to uh, know himself as the kind of a control over this whole system or even control over gods himself i think so we know that one of the verse says that uh, the gods in fact know are controlled by the mantra and the mantra is the in fact no word of uh, the brahmin so therefore the rationality is that brahmin is the god on earth that is bhudeva actually so such kind of a prop propagation and uh, the discourse in fact no has been there in the popular parlance and uh, we see that various texts brahminical texts they show anthropomorphism where different in fact no like in a sense uh, anthropomorph uh, so no natural elements they come in fact no into the into the fold of power getting manifold and regulating the behavior of the society we pretty well know that levi strauss he explains how various things are humanized in explaining the anthropomorphism and uh, so no any inequality in the society where levi strauss as we know he has a very sound of field work in several uh, so no uh, societies in the world uh, another french person frenchman who has moved in fact no studied mexico studied europe and he also has studied india and bangladesh of course like in you know, that term it was not bangladesh actually so he was there in calcutta he was there also in fact no dhaka and many areas like he knows he was in africa so levi strauss in fact no wherever he has seen inequal social inequality where he has talked about how how various things are humanized and refocused towards power centers so that the redundancy of myth gains power over the mind leading to uncritical acceptance or belief in values without questioning the logic behind the inequality this is what of course we know pretty well how levi strauss in fact went into the structural analysis of myth so analyzing several myths uh, strauss shows us in fact no that uh, power like in a sense the the reinforcing reinforcing of power uh as in fact no through myth actually gains currency in the society in promoting in a kind of a uncritical unquestionable in fact no acceptance to the pop populated myth actually so now friends uh we'll go with all other ancient cultures like uh, like we see roman and greek they pass through the stage of myths controlling the society see myths have been controlling the society probably we have seen in the ancient roman and greek but later they moved forward actually they moved uh, you know uh, from that kind of position the corpus of brahminical myths and texts they still hold sway over the people in india as quote unquote fountains of knowledge only because of the power of discourse actually so this is exactly what uh, i'd like to you know talk about my dear friends in order to control the masses the elite at every level of existence uh they utilize the ideology of brahmanism developed two kinds of uh, say or two versions of discourses if you look into the uh, you know brahmanical uh, discourses basically which have been uh, uh, you know propped out there are two versions one version is the popular mode which is a medley of several rituals religio philosophical concepts and myths which can be termed as a kind of praxis actually see like in a sense it's only a practice see the popular mobs you know version of discourse only related to the practice rituals this is what you as you should do and which in fact no is you know a myth that uh, uh, you know uh, justifies this kind of a ritual and an action but there is an other kind of version which basically is a deep doctrine drawn from the vedas upanishad all this kind of literature vedas vedantas shruta smrutis aranyakas brahmani brahmanikas upanishads epics or even puranas all these texts actually they are out of reach for the majority populations those philosophical in fact no doctor was no discussions or even deeper doctrine uh, from these kind of uh, so no like in a sense uh, composed texts are away from in fact no the common people they are highlighted by the brahmanical ideologues as the final authority to which they only have the monopoly of access so here what i'm trying to say is see the privileged group which has positioned itself in fact now as the powerful they are the originator of the text and they them they themselves are the interpreters of the text and the 
rest of the majority people they do not have any kind of an authority or access to reach them they were only they were only in fact no restricted only to uh, certain rituals religious you know philosophical concepts and myths and they were kept at the level of praxis practicing them that's all not trying to understand the very logic or in fact no like uh, the metaphysical uh, things behind it actually so this is a kind of an inbuilt duality which is deliberately designed so that culture at every stage and level never goes beyond the control of the brahmanical minority this interesting feature is that even the propagators of the exclusionist hegemonic ideology believed that it is a matter of unquestionable faith perhaps not being aware of the fact that this control of discourse positions them in the place of advantage to control the material resource of society if we again look into the historic uh, historians like dd kosambi or even robla thapar they agree that the elaborate expensive rituals which only rich people can afford or even kings can afford are designed and developed to benefit the brahmanical class without resorting to any direct violent means of siphoning of the surplus production if somebody goes into that kind of analysis actually they try to explain in the material uh, you know uh, discourse saying that all these religious rituals all these things in fact no at the center of it robla thapar and kosambi they say that at the center of it the intention is to siphon of the uh, surplus actually to the control of those who do not produce they talk about the producing caste and the appropriating caste actually so therefore the appropriating caste in fact no have to draw the production excess production into their control without any uh, direct uh, violence so therefore this power of discourse through religious means and all this kind of a, what you call meta narrative which they have formed helps them in such draw, drawing of uh, so no uh, so no what you call uh, uh, surplus production actually so now we have three concepts again looking we look into three concepts power over discourse power through discourse and power of discourse are interrelated and mutually reinforcing factors in the, in the power over discourse like in the sense we see as the power of discourse leads to power through discourse and due to its authoritarian and monopolistic nature ending finally in the power of discourse which again recharges the power of discourse so this is in fact now mutually like uh, what you call uh, uh, say oh, so no beneficial one leads to another and the other in fact now again uh, say re reinforces the first so this is a kind of a what you call a uh, uh, kind of a continual kind of what you call continuum that we see in the brahmanical kind of a discourse this results in the legitimization and sanctification of discourse which explains certain uh, which excludes certain groups from having access to resources and reduces them to the level of subhuman existence i will not take much time friends like in a sense i will use a few examples we, we can bring in a lot of examples to explain uh, these three concepts of power over discourse and power through discourse in the in the in the articulation of power and discourse i will try to in fact now look into these things we will we'll see the power over discourse aspect first foco points out that the people are generally unaware unaware of, of the ways cultural power molds their system of thought and behavior see normal in fact now like common people in fact they are really unaware and as we know majority of population in fact now they live their lives they live their lives as a matter of habit not as a matter of in fact no like a constant uh, so no consensitized or in fact no like a conscious living a majority of uh, the society it lives uh, so no their lives as a matter of habit as in fact no comes to the culture so people are generally unaware of the ways cultural power molds their system of thought and behavior and suggests that knowledge and power are directly linked that power produces knowledge that power and knowledge directly imply each other so clearly then the groups in a society that can control the knowledge and how it is used will have the ability to determine what quote unquote truth is see truth of course in fact no is relational again so what says the like what what what, what this kind of a discourse talks about is 
that powerful groups produce certain kind of knowledge and that knowledge in fact no reinforces the kind of power and this kind of uh, knowledge also determines what are the facts of life what is the truth of life actually what cosmology cosmic view what world view in fact no one has to understand so this is a kind of a uh, so no interlinked kind of a uh, say uh, uh, say kind of a system which in a way can be called as colonizing the minds of the man, ma masses so like in a sense in india we know in order to colonize the minds of the masses education is used to marshal and brainwash people into physical and mental slavery so india has in fact no what you call uh, an infamous uh, so no kind of credit of denying education to the majority for several uh, millennia actually so whatever education that is given again that has been given to this end of brainwashing and uh, marshaling us uh, now people into physical and mental slavery without any sort of a contestation so the kind of education is denied denied at first place and selective interpretations and injections are provided to the illiterate majority regulating the behavior suitable and advantage to the minority so here we see the brahmin in fact now as always acts as a conduit of knowledge not then even today all the newer uh, so no kind of knowledges they are mediated to the other the so uh, no uh, large majority through these privileged groups actually all knowledges even you say it or if you talk about nanotechnology or you can talk about in fact no like in a sense uh, uh artificial intelligence robotics or even in fact no like in a sense in areas where uh, even social sciences where like in a sense robo sexism or uh, gendering the robots so if you go to that aspects and all even you will find the advantageous groups naturally get into the access and the remaining large majority they try to only follow them actually because they always that's what uh, mn srinivas uh, says us when this group in fact no tries to get the better advantage of the current society and try to sit on the uh, you know uh, what do you call uh, the top of the hill and watches others following them and when the others are about to reach them they jump to another cliff and then try to keep the pace like that so this is exactly what in fact no ambedkar and even foco was trying to explain uh, just like uh, sanam sin was uh, so now try to put couch that in the uh, social sciences you know kind of a paradigm so he says that in fact no the brahmin always act as a conduit of knowledge alter and mediate knowledge for their ends sustain their position and as controllers and modulators of the discourse through the power of ritual that's exactly what we see through the power of ritual this this dominant group controls the actions of all including the king actually the ruler also in fact now has to follow this another you know, kind of a, the myth of brahminical power lies in fashioning his word as curse even to control the king not to talk about the commoners i am just trying to bring in one kind of thing if a person is angry against another person uh what we generally see is abuses a person in fact no abuses but the same kind of an abuse if it is spelled out from the mouth of a brahmin it is it is taken as a curse which has the power of in fact now becoming a reality itself even kings even the rulers in fact now uh, uh, we have seen that they are afraid of this kind of uh, so now the discourse of curse coming from the brahmin's mouth and then suddenly to them so they have they have they have created that kind of a power of in fact now uh, discourse fashioning others anger as abuse and his anger as a curse so probably i think so we can with the simple example we can understand the theory and practice is mediated through their interpretation of myths and morals quote and quote and is ironical that there is a huge gap between of course what they preach and what they practice so there is always a practice but these medley of rituals are all in fact now have been designed propagated and then controlled uh, for others to follow then let us see what is this power through discourse actually this discourse in fact now creates an illusion that economic exploitation of the lower caste is a natural consequence so this is this is what in fact now i am so now i'll try to explain and this is exactly what dr ambedkar talked about caste mode of exploitation 
he is a caste mode of production and exploitation basically so this brahminical discourse creates an illusion what is that illusion that appropriation of uh, you know uh, what do you call uh, economic surplus from the lower caste is a natural uh, consequence we know the three unproductive you know uh, you know are parasitical groups all the three the brahmin kshatriya and vaishya they corner the surplus production and the labor of the masses as their right and privilege so we see that in fact no there are certain rights and privileges which have been prescribed in the brahminical system actually and uh, the to serve in fact no has been considered as a matter of right for the shudra and other groups and to appropriate in fact no like uh, to to receive the services in back in fact has been looked upon as the right of the the minority so therefore the productive part of the society the shudras and ati shudras are unable to enjoy the fruits of their labor this discourse in fact to creates social legitimacy of exploitation we know like in a sense uh, the, 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 you see that these three groups actually they act as colluders wherein the producers are painted as lowly and the parasites are glorified this is the arena of the system basically which we talk about therefore the privileges and benefits enjoyed by the minority upper caste are projected as legitimate rights not as unjust exploitation so this is done through power of uh, power through discourse see the privileges and benefits enjoyed by the minority upper caste are projected as legitimate legitimate rights and not as unjust exploitation through the medium of discourse conning some the people into a state of blind acceptance so this is what uh, so now we are, we are trying to look into see using different kind of uh, like in a sense uh, rationalizing uh, what do you call discourses like the theory of karma like other things and all and uh, the kind of concept of uh, predestination of things and all so get looted in fact no is looked upon as my predestination and to loot or to in fact appropriate the surplus has been looked upon as a legitimate right of the people actually not as not as naked exploitation so this is the power of that fight kind of a power uh, that they get through the discourse actually so even if you couch the same thing to the present uh, so no situation of uh, uh, what do you call uh, the rich becoming richer the poor becoming poorer in this neo liberalization uh, kind of an economy what we have seen in the, in the previous kind of uh, uh, talks that how the uh, so no india's inequality report which have been there in fact no in the so you no know, uh, uh, parlance where just 10% of the people they appropriate today that they appropriate more than 73% of the total resources of the country and we also see in 2022 that just 1% of the population they appropriate in fact they control more than 56% of the uh, resources of this nation actually so therefore how does it happen this has been happening in fact now through this kind of a power through discourse it doesn't irk it doesn't kick start a revolution if such a thing happens in fact no any kind of uh, uh, other society that obviously would lead to a kind of an unrest how when how and why it happens and all but in india in a caste based society the brahminical discourse which we talk about it creates a power which legitimizes in fact no inequality which also legitimizes in fact no like uh, the unjust exploitation uh, as a kind of a state of blind acceptance and as a kind of a uh what do you call uh, projected as a legitimate right actually so now we'll go to the pattern of continuity of domination through the discourse it was broken by the introduction of a new discourse by the british so british in fact now like there are two things which happened during the british certain of the things have been opened up the groups which have been in fact now like uh, privileged before the advent of the british they also got benefited they also got what do you call in fact now established themselves in fact now as the inheritors of uh, the power at the same time a small leave a small in fact now like in a sense opportunity was also created for the disadvantaged caste during the british time actually so on one side we see a kind of a collusive uh, so no colonialism a collusion collusion collusive colonialism happening between 
the brahminical sections and also the british and on the other side you see in fact now some of the lower caste you know, caste groups trying to get the advantage of education and also in fact now some sort of a, a say uh, uh, government as an employment and try to in fact now like the you know, attain some sort of a social mobility both things in fact now have become possible in during the british colonial, colonial period and both in fact now have to an extent try to destabilize the caste system but at the same time this collusive colonialism which i am talking about it also try to in fact now reinforce the same so this is in fact now like in a sense uh, british of course the demo democratic ideals uh, other things in fact now have been brought into the areas of power actually this new discourse has been actively adopted as assimilated by the brahminical sections gaining access to the new emerging centers of knowledge and discourse and consequent positions in the bureaucracy i can give several examples like in a sense uh, in 1918 59 the british in fact now they have allowed the indians to uh, so now get into the ias or even the ics they used to call it ics those days indian crown service so in 1859 when they started opening it actually the first ever ics officer in this country was uh, the eldest brother of ravindranath tagore satyendranath tagore tagore in fact now are a very very powerful brahminical groups actually uh, that time in fact now in uh, the bengal so starting from satyendranath tagore from 1859 to 1911 almost 100% of the let's say uh, what do you call uh, the ics officers are from the same section and they used to appear for uh, the so called competitive examination of ics not in any subject called as mathematics philosophy or the great the uh, the course you know, specializations their specializations are only sanskrit and uh, urdu which basically I, those papers in fact no are valued not in england but in india basically you know that kind of an advantage so the point which i am trying to is they have been very uh, sir what do you call uh, ready to jump and take in the new co new discourse at the same time like in a sense you have people like uh, rajara mohan rai kesab chandra sen who were also in fact now trying to promote english as a kind of a medium english education which of course like in a sense initially benefited the brahminical sections and later on they have been percolated down because of the uh, so now intervention of the british to the so called lower sections where the lower sections in fact now catch caught hold of the advantage of this education and try to in fact now destabilize uh, the kind of a exploitative social order so therefore friends uh, yeah the kind of a so called uh, uh, social reforms which ambedkar really uh, brands them not as social reforms but there are sectional reforms when any when you talk about sati uh, so no forceful widowhood or even in fact no like in a sense child marriages ambedkar says these are the sectional reforms of only the so called upper caste and these traditions were not there in the majority caste at all so therefore we'll come back actually the caste caste affiliation and affinity is the secret understanding by which members of a caste help and benefit each other by using the resources of the state which are meant for the whole society in other words caste is the cultural capital to the minority sections and a liability to the majority which binds them to sustain their advantage position in the society so here we see friends today after the decline of the public sector again which provided employment for the cro two crores of people giving place to the so called uh, so, no, uh, so called private sector why i called so called private sector is that technically in fact no there is no private uh, sector in this country they have to be legally technically should be called as a public you know sector sector enterprises actually public funded enterprises there is no so called quote and quote private in this country all so called private of you know, these things they draw they draw everything from the public actually to the kind of deposits which they you know call them as shares from the public they take loans from the public uh, uh, say financial institutions which are banks and then uh, drown them they take in fact everything on concession from the government lands water power 
all in fact importers know say taxation taxation or concessions many things they take but still they want to call them as public uh, private there is no such thing technical in india unfortunately they are called as a private and all so we see what we see is caste has transformed from cultural capital to financial capital the corporate sector is organized and maintained on the basis of caste of nity with members of few castes in all key controlling positions the western model of openness of recruitment and promotion based on efficiency and capabilities has been displaced in preference to caste loyalties while abilities are given second priority this is what we have discussed in the discussion on caste and uh, sorry, cultural capital where we have seen even the software or all the corporate houses basically which talk about in fact no like so called merit and all they obviously basically are networks of caste relationships which have been thoroughly you know, proved by so many of uh, the you know, academic you know, kind of investigations so even globalization did not escape the octopusian tendencies of caste as we see now caste has the protean quality of assuming any form or shape based on the existing conditions with the singular motive of sustaining superior position in the society and the prioritization of access to all resources so this is something which we don't have to we need not explain we have seen what's happening with the card to the economic as now seen in this country in the so called 21st century so now friends today india in fact now what we see is incompatibility of ideologies and continuing contradictions so brahmanical ideology as we see basically is a kind of ideology of exclusion but this sort of ideology is in fact now like a, a say a put to as kind of a, a what you call a, an attack by the constitutional ideology or a democratic ideology but unfortunately like in a sense what we see is that has not fructified the social inclusion policy in india has been the outcome of these several social political movements culminating in the constitution in which democratic foundations have been envisaged for establishing an integrative society with one person one value but we know friends that even after seven decades of constitutional uh, policy democratic ideals are yet to find firm ground among the citizens of this country several studies indicate the fact that in practice the state to a large extent that mean government to a large extent not only failed to address the problems of poverty exclusion and social injustice but also actively served to reinforce the same this is a kind of a thing which all we have seen in the previous uh, kind of a discussions if you look into the constitution probably later on we'll talk about the constitution where constitution clearly talks about establishing a, a, a kind of a egalitarian social order the constitution if you look into article 38 it it puts the duty duty on the government to establish and promote a social system pulling down this an unequal social system but we see in fact no the the government the successive governments have not done it but what they have done is in fact no to reinstate or enforce uh, reinforce the kind of unequal system against the constitution and uh, yeah so these are unmitigated kind of a, was like in a sense uh, contradictions which dr ambedkar uh, way back in fact no 19 in uh, 50 he declares the unmitigated contradictions of our society have resulted in a situation that the laws are on the side of equality and customs that people follow in their daily lives are on the side of inequality so this is the situation that we see today the law is on the side of equality but the customs that people follow every day they are on the side of inequality what is why, why is this paradox this paradox in fact now has been explained by ambedkar himself as the incompatibility of ide ideologies so he says i quote indians today are governed by two different ideologies their political ideology set out in the preamble of the constitution affirms life of liberty equality and fraternity he says that in the constitution the ideology that is enshrined in the preamble is a democratic ideology and it promises a life of liberty equality fraternity to all citizens however dr ambedkar says their social ideal 
embodied in their religion and in their daily life denies such kind of a thing so he says that this brahmical ideology it denies all that part of there that is there in the constitution so it is anti democratic anti majority anti in fact no like in a sense of, say democracy actually so that is exactly what ambedkar tries to explain this is a paradox so he also says so long as the foundations of democratic society are not laid properly and liberty equality and fraternity as principles of life are not recognized and practiced as a way of life india remains as an exclusive society we see as ambedkar says again the laws cannot guarantee people their rights when ethos of the society does not recognize and respect them ambedkar in many many occasions he said in fact no your rights are not protected by the law alone your rights are protected by the social and moral concerns of the society so therefore he says that as long as brahmanical ideology and this social order it keeps in fact no informing the citizens about a cotler discourse the constitution or even the laws the democratic values of liberty justice freedom and equality in fact no they never as you know uh, become the dominant discourse of the society as long as brahmanical ideology becomes the dom dominant discourse this becomes in fact no uh, democracy becomes a marginalized discourse so that is what we have seen and neila kabir says in 2008 experience has shown that simply bestowing equal rights based on some universalistic notion of citizenship does not guarantee equal agency equal opportunity influence or outcome that is again same thing she is uh, in fact no like in a sense uh, uh, what do you call echoing of rabetkar so just in fact no bringing a constitution just in fact you know giving a law or a right on their own does do not in fact no like in a sense bring up change in the society it is the discourse that has been in fact no like racialized mediated that has to change actually so while the commitment and efficiency of the state in implementing the policies of inclusion have been increasingly put to criticism globalization has set in the role of private sector as a stakeholder in implementing these policies as a part of corporate social responsibility this is another irony when the governments themselves democratically elected governments themselves they have been reinforcing in fact no the brahmanical uh, kind of a social order we have seen right now in fact no they are now as a corporate social responsibility they were given in charge of in fact no bringing out uh, implementing the policies it is important to note that whatever claims made by made for efficiency and effectiveness the so called private sector in india which is in the hands of few privileged castes have never been renowned for their adherence to such collective goals as equity social justice and social inclusion several instances can be brought into a test that in the policy domain the operation of social policy itself has become a mechanism of exclusion in their attempts to in fact implement a policy that itself also in fact now have been resulting in a matter of exclusion so friends as a concept social exclusion provides a revealing barometer of a society's willingness to tolerate deprivation and discrimination in its mindset this is what in fact now ambedkar says see the kind of an ideology the 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 mediation of power through discourse power over discourse and uh, power of discourse basically of the brahmical society they in fact no like create a situation where the tolerance of deprivation and discrimination in fact no doesn't have any bounds it is because as we have seen in the uh, you know social system both the beneficiaries and the victims of the social order they have become the slaves of the same ideology that has been in fact no a, a kind of a what you call unique kind of a situation in india basically so in addressing the existing deprivations two kinds of remedies have been suggested by the constitution one are called one is called an affirmative remedy and other is called as a transformative remedy affirmative remedies are those which aim at correcting the inequitable outcomes of the social arrangements without disturbing the underlying institutional framework which gave rise to it 
so affirmatives are in fact now some in fact now rules some sort of uh, say conditions which are which come up and then interact with the or influence or try to in fact to bring down certain unequal institutions but they don't they don't touch upon the edifice the whole, whole foundation of it but transformative remedies they aim to correct for inequality by restructuring the underlying whole framework or restructuring the society uh, to effectuate these remedies into practice in indian society friends it requires a commitment of the state in implementing its affirmative programs effectively and in order to bring about transformation in an essentially exclusive society in a, like india the ideology upon which the society and the social order is conceived and operated must be replaced by developing consciousness and consensitization among the people in bringing up an integrative and inclusive society transcending the long established but artificial uh, so no, social economic political and cultural distinction of this kind of a brahmanical caste society so friends it all depends on the will and preparedness of the society to involve in such kind of uh, a transformative environment and that's the basic aim of in fact now all those who want in fact now a kind of a discourse which results in a kind of a life of liberty equality fraternity and justice in a society which is even in 21st century basically but that re requires in fact now the will and preparedness of the society to get rid of these kind of in fact now the discourses which try to rationalize which try to promote which try to in fact now like uh, say uh, mediate into all kinds of so called modern post modern or even globalized the kind of a society so the attempt in fact now is required and i thank you very much for your time and patience in listening to this kind of this paper of uh, on the topic the ideology of exclusion and its cultural politics in indian society today thank you thank you professor satyapal kumar sir for your valuable uh, presentation on the topic um, really this is a uh, very informative and uh, uh, very insightful and a practical uh, explanation and uh, uh, of bringing uh, different uh, uh, scholars um, who studied caste system in india uh, local and uh, uh, international scholars and uh, they bringing the analysis and uh, and uh, helping us understand um, how this uh, exclusion and the uh, power and discourse um, are uh, reinforced through the brahmanical system and how the majority of uh, indian society are uh, really treated and uh, uh, inequally and uh, all these things are very uh, informative or illuminating uh, and thank you for helping us understand what exactly is going on um, uh, for the centuries uh, now i request um, uh the participants to post questions if you have any questions needed clarifications or any comments uh please uh, utilize this time for to interact with the speaker we are social scientists uh, trying to uh, understand our uh, own society and um, here uh, we pay attention to the speaker and uh, uh, who brought uh, a bunch of scholars and authorities uh, um, who studied on caste system um, for example uh, uh, dr b r ambedkar uh, and his views on caste and amart sen and uh, uh, louis, louis dumont and uh, uh, and many other scholars mentioned by uh, our uh, um, speaker yeah this is open for discussion and uh, posing questions
<laughs> perfect silence. Uh, I'm looking for who will break the silence and uh, from the audience. Their learned audience are there. Yes. Dr. Sadanand Sugandhi, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, I don't have any questions and also comments, but uh, uh, I would say I thank uh, uh, Professor Satyapal, sir, because he is uh, uh, well uh, valuable and uh, well uh, insightful and very, very powerful presentation. And uh, I have learned uh, many things from Sir's presentation. Therefore, I would say a lot of thanks to Professor Satyapal, sir, and also you uh, brought, sir, to us. And uh, Dr. Sadarand, we are colleagues, and then we are learning from each other, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, we because uh, yeah. sir, for second semester, I'm teaching uh, Dr. B.R. Um, anthropology of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. One course is there. Sir. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Yes, actually. sir. Yeah. From uh, 2019, I'm oh, teaching that course in uh, for second semester. Sir. Oh, that's really yes, great. Sir. And I, I never knew that, actually. <laughs> that's very interesting. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, yes, I'm quite interested, in fact, no, knowing about the coursework, actually, what's going on. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, definitely, yeah. sir. Therefore, and uh, uh, I really, in fact, no, like, uh, so, no, uh, wish uh, that you were there in that uh, first discussion we had, yes. where I, I brought out, in fact, no, Ambedkar's uh, uh, connections with anthropology. Yes, sir. So, uh, Ambedkar's connection with uh, French boys, yes, Robert's sir. connection with the Golden Visor, and his yes, connection sir. with, in fact, no other uh, you know, anthropologist of that time, actually. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, yeah. mm. uh, he was a student of Gold, uh, Golden Visor, and yeah. he had a uh, five course in anthropology. Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. That's Therefore, true. he is the first and very important anthropologist of Indian origin. That, that, that's right. Yes. Sir. And uh, who presents his paper on castes in the in India. Yes, yes, yes. Later on, that was published in Indian Antiquary in 1970. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, to my most... fortune, in fact, no, I had a small stint of teaching at Columbia University. Is it so? Uh, uh, yes, in our Department of Anthropology. And also, there is another department which yeah. deals with uh, uh, Indic studies. I yes. was with uh, Professor Frances Pritchard, yes. who has, uh, she has, in fact, no, uh, yeah. brought a uh, Ambedkar's annihilation of caste as a coursework in the Columbia University, New York. Yes, yes. So sir. I was assisting as a hers for some time, yeah. actually. Yes, wow. sir. Most of the Western universities are now teaching and yes, adopting yes. Ambedkar's right. thinking in yes. their curriculum. Yes, yeah, more, moreover, like in US, actually, uh, nearly 23 universities yes, they have recognized that caste as one of the, in fact, no, like, uh, 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 say, uh, factor of discrimination. Yes, and uh, those universities have taken it up, in fact, no, as a matter of uh, uh, what you call uh, observation that, that such things should not be there on their campuses. Yes. That has been because of the, uh, the kind of an active, uh, say, kind of a representation and uh, an active kind of, like in a sense, uh, resolve taken by many of the academics in U.S., both yes. in U.S. and then elsewhere, in India as well. Yes. So it's, it's very, it's, you know... Uh, like encouraging to know that you are taking yeah. this particular topic. Yes. Uh, probably, I think so. We can we can learn from each other that way. <laughs> yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pedrataya. Sir, sir. <laughs> if there are no more these things at all, I'll sir, have to pack and leave early morning. <laughs> <to work in. laughs> sir, good evening, sir. sir. Yeah, good evening. Sir, good evening. Myself, Arun uh, Kumar. Yes, please. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Please yes, go sir. ahead. You're, you're yes, audible, sir. sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, today's presentation is very nice, sir. Uh, I have some little one doubt, one question. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, please. Uh, I, I belong to schedule class and the question is from my side only and our own problem. Uh, even though people are uh, graduated, got uh, 
good job and uh, they are in good position but uh, they are following the brahmanism varun vyavastha the culture what they uh, uh, what is the culture of brahmanism they are following the same so i think that uh, for that only for that reason only we are not coming out of that culture, that brahman vyavastha what is we called as varun vyavastha Uh, until then we left that culture then only we come out with that brahmana vyavastha it's uh, okay sir yeah your your observations are quite right from the perspective of ambedkar where uh, ambedkar obviously says that although he says education is that which liberates uh, education is very much necessary for uh, pulling down this uh, inequal system yes, but and ambedkar very well said uh, that those who are educated today cannot be termed as educated probably i think so we dis- ambedkar made a distinction between the literates and the education yes, so literates are those who have got all the degrees like in the sense uh, maybe post graduation phd's other kind of degrees yes. but ambedkar says that the literates all the literates cannot be called as educated yes. that is the basic problem actually we have we are yes. more more of literates but less of educated people so who are educated in the in the definition of ambedkar he writes that in his uh, volume 5 writings and speeches he says that an educated person must be able to understand the society and its problems and should take up the responsibility to find solutions to negate the kind of a situation which promotes and reinforces these inequalities so only those people ambedkar calls them as educated rest of the group in fact now we are talking about they are all again uh, what he says is uh, like uh, they are literates who still in fact no like in a sense uh, are in the under the grip of brahmanism they are under the silent terror what we, we when i when we talked about culture of violence actually we said they are victims of uh, the silent terror so therefore they get the what is in priority taught in the kind of a society but they do not have take up the kadgals to rationalize that they have a responsibility to change the society see abedkar are even in fact no those uh, bahujan icons right from jyotra phule sahu maras narayan guru ayen kali ayodhyadas periyar um, you know birsamunda all these people including ambedkar periyar all these people all of these people in fact no they fought for the right to education actually we know in the as uh, a modern society they all fought for education their fight for education in fact no just cannot be construed just as few seats in some uh, colleges or in fact no few posts in some offices it's not for that they fought actually they their fight in fact no is to create a system whereby these people who get education and opportunity they have a responsibility social responsibility to change the society actually but unfortunately what we are talking about is these people who have the who are the beneficiaries of the social movements they just become beneficiaries and do not uh, so now uh, take up that responsibility to see that the system is changed so that's the problem that's why at one point ambedkar also says the misery of the masses is because of the indifference of the educated i think so it's a very apt kind of a uh, observation that ambedkar said the misery of the masses is because of the indifference of the educated right of course the brahmical society or brahmical groups they do whatever like in a sense they do they are uh, so you know, they they try to Uh, continue their you know uh, uh, prevalence they continued their hegemony and nobody like in a sense commits a suicide of giving all their powers and privileges just like that you will have to win win that part you have to create that kind of power and that is exactly ambedkar writes if you want to change in the system and i am quoting ambedkar again if you want any change in the system you must put the system under constant pressure that's what in fact no happens with the responsibility of the educated that's what he said 
so un unfortunately like in a sense as uh, as now as you have spelled out arun kumar sir the educated who are beneficiaries of the social movement are not delivering their responsibility that's the uh, what you call sad part of it Uh, the beneficiary people they are the prompt follower of varun vivastha sir nowadays I, <laughs> that's uh, it, right <laughs> it's a fact and it's in our family only i yeah. observe it not even telling about other yes that's a right observation sir the followers of uh, varun vivastha so they want to they want to project their perfect slaves or even more slaves of the system rather than in fact no somebody who who abolishes a kind of a body call uh, uh enslaving the mindset and system actually they want to prove that they are very good slaves of the system they want to get uh, all kinds of praises from their oppressors is that why only the one vyavastha is not uh, continuing raising uh, that's, right. that's right see it is not through coercion ambedkar says the system is continued by consent their own willful and wanton so you know kind of a uh so, so kind of a continuance of the system so that is because of several things actually like in a sense through religion and also through in fact no like in a sense of uh, uh, what do you call popular pressure and also in fact no somebody many many people wants to please their masters that is a kind of a what do you call a, a kind of a situation where they wants to uh, sort of project that they are perfect slaves that's it your sir right sir right observation sir thank you yes sir okay thank you sir thank you sir. thank you sir no. i i want to i want to give a few thoughts here uh, this uh, it, the, this is a matter of world view actually uh, this uh, um, the brahminical system has uh, uh, formulated a world view where uh, humans are created inequally so that inequality is justified by the religion and the social practices and the cultural uh, customs and uh, norms and impositions and um, uh, uh, sanctions and all those things here the constitution came and the globalization came and many uh, the process of socialization and uh, exposure to the universal values and uh, universal human rights and uh, many international uh, ngos and uh, multilateral uh, uh, um, institutions uh, uh, development organizations think tanks they're all coming and trying to um, illuminate uh, the uh, institute education institutions but uh, they they are assisting in policy structure uh, formulating a uh, um pro poor and uh, development policies uh, uh, in that area uh, they are doing something uh, concrete and uh, um, uh, in incremental basis and uh, uh, remarkable changes are witnessed uh, um, the locally and uh, globally uh, but the majority of the uh, humans in india um, their world views are need to be uh, transformed in the sense um, all humans are uh, created equally and all humans are uh, uh, dignified and, uh, and the, the 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 right to freedom the right to uh, dignity the right to autonomy the right the right um, the self respect the positive attitudes um, need to be uh, inculcated facilitated that education is missing in indian education system so uh, so we i'm interacting with the schools and colleges and even uh, the pr delivering presentations uh, at the university and the engineering colleges uh, particularly uh, life orientation program kind of thing so <clears throat> here uh, unless individuals uh, particularly educated um, uh, the illuminated uh, minds uh, take responsibility and uh, visit the educational institutions and um, uh, offer consultations and uh, help uh, students and uh, next generations and present generation to understand uh, the uh, the value of the positive attitudes and positive thinking uh, so that uh, uh, this world view shift and the paradigm shift might happen so that kind of education is needed uh um, so education should be redefined and uh, we even uh, national education policy also brought a few 
um, a handful of uh, values um, to be inculcated uh, kind of thing. So more, more need to be done on that front uh, so that um, the worldview, the, which is uh, passed down from generation to generation, from uh, centuries to centuries, uh, to our generations uh, need to need not to be continued uh, the, the worldview which uh, promotes uh, alternative and uh, dignified values uh, that uh, awareness and uh, that uh, education is my, is the need of the hour. Uh, right observation to an extent but the pause front is in fact now education is not the only you know, kind of an avenue to pull down this inhuman kind of a worldview. Ambedkar himself wrote saying that education is like a double-edged sword. It's like a double-edged sword. If education is the only virtue that can make an individual uh, into a good human being, leading to, in fact, now good kind of a citizenry and good society, they then uh, Brahmins, in fact, know who have been monopolized education for thousands of years. They should have been the humane personalities. But the, the history proves, in fact, now the otherwise. So, therefore, Ambedkar says it is in this society, education is coupled with the vested interests of keeping their, as in fact, now uh, caste interests as superior. So, education coupled with vested interests is like a double edged sword. It works doubly. So other thing is like, in fact, you now, uh, whatever many people are doing, I really appreciate what are they doing, in fact, you now, in the uh, NGO sector or different, as in fact, you now, uh, attempts to bring in some sort of a uh, uh, kind of a attempt to make the society a kind of an equal society. But the problem is, if you want to, I, I'll, I'll try to bring an analogy. If you want to kill a poisonous tree, which bears poisonous fruits, for example. If you try to, in fact, now fight on the effects of the kind of uh, uh, that particular system, you'll be continuously fighting on the effects only. You will not be fighting on the cause. If you want to kill that kind of a poisonous tree, it is not enough to cut the root, cut the shoots, cut the branches. Now, one has to put acts on the root of the you know, tree. If you, if you don't do that, you'll be only busy fighting all the effects. So therefore, the fountainhead of all the, the, the kind of uh, inequalities in India is because of this unequal system promoted by this ideology of exclusion. Unless you try to, in fact, now uh, mitigate that particular issue by consensitization, that's exactly what I you know, call it. This is what, uh, say, what Paulo Freire, uh, in fact, now a great educational philosopher, uh, he was, in fact, now, like uh, in his book, I think, so I suggest, like, the title of the book is uh, the, the, like, in the sense of Freire's book is the, uh, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. That's a wonderful kind of this thing. So he wants to bring in that kind of a consensitization among the deprived people. Of course, he tried that in Favelas of Brazil, actually. So that kind of a consensitization is important. People need to introspect, think. Exactly. And then, in fact, no, they, they, they need to, in fact, like interrogate what they have been doing. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what is required. So otherwise, if people try to live their lives as a matter of habit, uh, feel that, in fact, no, these things are all uh, kind of uh, given by the God. So that is uh, where one can't tackle this particular uh, the concept of natural inequality, which Dr. Ambedkar said, the Brahminic ideology premises the natural inequality. So this natural inequality, it's like a software, which I told you, if you hold these glasses, everything in fact now has to be painted inequally. The foods, occupations, nature, and even gods are actually like in a sense, uh, uh, made into high and low gods. So this is a kind of a package. That concept of natural inequality has to be debased. Otherwise, in like the sense, as you really said, the worldview will not uh, get corrected. Yeah, thank you for that observation. Sir, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, in the initial stage of uh, Indian civil services, 
uh, is, um, it was dominated by the Tagurs or uh, Brahmins. But uh, recently, interesting trends are emerging in Indian civil services. The self-respected young individuals are who are inspired and aspire to serve the people, to serve the fellow humans, uh, and to to make uh, to facilitate the in positive change and uh, to make positive impact on the society. So, self-motivated, inspired uh, people are coming forward and acquiring the required competencies uh, needed for uh, um, suc uh, to succeed uh, in uh, civil service. Services examination, Indian civil service examination, they are finally succeeding irrespective of caste background. Even from uh, the lower caste and uh, the uh, BCs, SCs, STs, irrespective of caste backgrounds, and the people are excelling in acquiring the important competencies required for Indian civil services. So that is a hope that brings, um, if uh, individuals are motivated positively and inspired to impact uh, society positively, then uh, there, there is no, nobody can stop it. And uh, that collective force, uh, really, uh, not only in civil services, some inspired um, self-motivated individuals starting NGOs and um, the, um, the um, uh, lobbying governments and uh, to do important things. Uh, here and there, we scattered examples are there and uh, very important. And we, we need to learn and uh, uh, harness that kind of potential uh, to really uh, bring this kind of uh, the worldview shift and uh, uh, needed a worldview transformation. Because this is uh, uh, the mindset issue and uh, it is uh, running in this behind the, it is like an iceberg, uh, only the tip of the iceberg we see, try to address the uh, symptoms, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, hidden and subconscious, all those things are need to be seriously taken into consideration and come yeah. up with the courses like this and uh, to uh, and uh, uh, we need to talk to the governments and uh, uh, see and the university authorities to in, uh, to introduce this kind of courses uh, where students uh, the uh, as you rightly mentioned um, Paulo Freire uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed uh, um, the the sensitization and uh, self retrospection and self reflection mm -hmm. and um, the collective consciousness uh, those things unless individuals uh, individually and collectively uh, reflect uh, what's going on why it is going on and uh, what need to be done and uh, what are the causes uh, the, uh, for the su suffering and oppression and uh, inequality and they only come up with the reasons they only come up with the solutions they only come up with the strategies individual and collectively that is the where i think uh, this can uh, we need to design much more courses and offer yeah you are right actually like in a sense uh, but uh, i would like to stress upon the point that the presence of uh, uh, the uh, you know different people in the civil services uh, they are based because of the system of representation which has brought in by the constitution and then social movements otherwise they would not be there and uh, yes there are some people of course if you take the case of obcs obcs have been in fact you no know, cheated in this part of the country even in, in the constitutional regime for more than in fact you know, like in the sense 50 60 years like uh, it's only after 1992 that the obcs have uh, started representing in fact you know, in the civil services but hitherto that was not there. They are majority of this society, 52%. So that was part of it. But again, I in my observation, what I've seen is those civil servants, if you talk about people there in the IAS, IPS, that steal from a bureaucracy, those who are socially minded, they really in fact know are uh, thinking minds, they also feel suffocated and they are moving away actually. They are resigning and then coming out. So that also shows that the steel frame is very, very strong mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't impact no, like, uh, uh, say, uh, like, uh, like in a sense, you know, it's not enough if you just enter into the system. But to find, in fact, no, your kind of, a, a, say, social responsibility becomes very tough because you, some people, many people whom I know, they find it difficult to fight from within. So therefore, they had to come out, actually. So, yeah. yeah. And as you said, yes, there are many people who are trying to do this, but uh, I would, uh, I, I wish that these attempts, in fact, now uh, turn into unified attempts. Exactly. Unified, in fact, now they'll be able to, like, in a sense, uh, 
like overcome the kind of adversary ambedkar also talked about this particular thing he said the efforts must be equal to the task pay of course people are making efforts but that effort must be in a proportion where it is equal or even more than enough to in fact not tackle your adversary otherwise these things they remain as attempts a unconnected uh, like in a sense what you call uh, 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 parochial in fact no uh, kind of attempts so we wish that such kind of uh, you know uh, democratic minded people and then uh, who really wants to establish a democratic civil society in this country convert all those who are in fact imprisoned in this caste framework liberate themselves and become equal citizens of this country uh, yes such people should come together and then uh, uh, make this country into a democratic society that, that's it a caste free society yeah. yes that's right caste free class free <laughs> and uh, so no uh, a civic society i should rather say yes yeah, yeah. Dear participants, is there any other uh, people who want to pose questions, sir? If they can't have like this, uh, spell out the questions. I think so. They can uh, text their questions. In fact, now in our WhatsApp group or whatever, like in the sense, if uh, that is there. shall we yeah <clears throat> dr sadanand garu it is a uh, very interesting that uh, you have initiated the course and uh, anthropology uh, uh, about uh, ambedkar and uh, offering already since uh, 2019 and yes. we would like allowed to hear something from you and your experiences and really uh, we want to see that go go into all the universities <laughs> yes uh, so what i have learned uh, uh, out of about ambedkar's literature and writings and uh, uh, he said that the soul of this uh, brahmanical a system lies in the endogamy uh, that is the mechanism uh, is still a uh, carrying that old system and again it carry further and uh, we have to uh, destroy that uh, practice of endogamy and slowly uh, uh, this uh, brahmanical uh, uh, society or uh, practice of this system slowly vanish one thing i have observed from his writings and uh, you told that about uh, education and some of the things we have to include newly that is uh, a constitutional morality uh, is necessary in the uh, school curriculum up to university if we adopt that constitutional morality in our day to day life then uh, there will be no any kind of discrimination and in human kind of practices in our society but uh, actually baba saheb's uh, last speech in the uh, constituent assembly already you have discussed that uh, ambedkar said we are entering into contradiction one side we have accepted this uh, democracy in political arena other side we are practicing the inequal a society or uh, the brahmanical way of life that is always contradiction in modern day also we are in contradiction either uh, uh, this uh, constitutional uh, values morality we have to adopt in our daily life or uh, already uh, we have practicing this brahmanical way of life uh, one uh, participant also uh, 
questioning and talking about how the learned uh, beneficiaries of Dr. P. R. Ambedkar have adopted the way of life of Brahminical society or Brahminical culture. Because uh, we are not uh, ready to accept the constitutional morality and the way of life of constitutionalism. And Ambedkar said, uh, this democracy is nothing but respecting our co-being. Uh, such kind of uh, things we have to adopt and we have to think. And slowly, uh, we'll keep the Brahminical way of life from uh, the depressed class of this Indian society. First, uh, uh, we are looking and we are trying to understand, we are trying to speak and uh, annihilate the, uh, the, the, the same existed uh, Brahminical society and that system. And uh, our focus and our concern should be the depressed community. How and why this depressed community is unnecessarily following the Brahminical way of life and uh, uh, we always focus upon the Brahmanism and the Manuva and their way of life. And actually, we have forgotten that we have to kill the practice of this caste system among existed in the uh, depressed community. Uh, that is what I have learned from Ambedkar's writings. But our focus should be there in the uh, among the depressed community and caste barriers among SCs, among sts among backwards uh, still we are following practicing the same old caste system and the discrimination and we are uh, talking uh, the about the brahman and brahmanical way of life and brahmins and uh, one side our focus, our goal should be to destroy this caste-based discrimination in society. And yet we are practicing following in our uh, strata or, or in, in our society, like among us, among us, among OBs. We are not ready to eradicate, we are not ready to reject this caste barrier within the uh, group. Uh, 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 that is uh, uh, my concern and uh, uh, in my classes also, um, I'll teach in keeping in that view in my mind about uh, this caste system and the problems of caste system. Because these depressed classes, people are the uh, losers in this uh, uh, system. But as soon as these people will understand the main cause for their all declination of their life is caste and caste discrimination. And if these people reject this caste system and caste discrimination uh, within their fold, definitely uh, 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 will make that, uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, Brahminical are the three Varna people as minor group because they are the micro minor people, already they are, but we believe they are the major because they show, uh, they shown with the help of education and their culture and different uh, medias. But problem is lies with among SC, ST and OBC. And uh, only uh, awareness is the only thing and Baba Sambedkar already uh, told always, this Brahmanism always uh, lies with the power. Brahmanism always use a power to uh, succeed in, in its way. Therefore, power is always important tool to control such a, a Brahmanical uh, system. What I have learned from Ambedkar, I'm now uh, teaching in my uh, classroom also. So. Mm. Uh, these are my uh, some understanding and uh, thinking about Ambedkar's literature and uh, his contribution. Just to one observation, sir. Uh, 
we are not here to destroy the endogamy uh, or anything it, uh, it is individual freedom to choose endogamy or exogamy but we are here uh, to bring the light uh, we are uh, to bring the universal human values respect yeah. for fellow individuals and uh, dignity for human life and uh, yes. Um, yes. turn human beings into being human uh, that's where anthropological yes. insights and applications uh, need to be developed and applied uh, in yes. the pra pragmatic uh, yes. situations um and uh, when when we bring uh, for example i know some brahmin friends uh, who are illuminated and they realize the exploitation uh, perpetuated by this brahmanical system and uh, they were they were thrown it and they embraced the universal values and the human dignity and uh, treating uh, fellow humans as equals and there are uh, here and there some individuals who are uh, illuminated and the uh, really human uh, being human so that kind of brahmin friends are also there and uh, we are not against the brahmins but uh, yeah 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 uh, brahminical system uh, yeah. we are against the brahminical system that impose sanctions and yeah. inequality and justifies the exploitation in the name of caste and the uh, varna system yeah. so yeah. Uh, we are here to bring freedom and yeah. from uh, freedom and redemption from yeah. the slavery uh, and uh, uh, be, because uh, the OBCs, OBCs and STs and SCs and all people are being passive sufferers, passive yeah. sufferers and passive receivers of the sanctions and uh, they are the victims of the system. So we want to bring illumination and uh, the reflection and the introspection and facilitate the conscientization, uh, uh, those things so that uh, the, uh, it is up to the individuals uh, to choose uh, uh which way to go and uh, and uh, generally everybody every human looks for dignity and uh, strives for thrives for and um, the aspires for respect and uh, dignity and equality and honor and uh, glory and power health and prosperity and life uh, right to life and education everything they want to grab and enjoy and they want to pass on to the future generations it is a human uh, desire and a human uh, there is inbuilt system is there for inbuilt uh, dis, uh, the unction is there for dignity so uh, that uh, that inner uh, the drive and this, uh, thriving and striving uh, those uh, human uh, the energies and faculties need to be uh, the uh, really uh, educated so that people will break the shackles cultural obstacles and social stigmas and um, then they, they will uh, overpower the they will become the uh, active uh, uh, and the um, benefits of the development and education and uh, available around. Yeah. Instead of passive sufferers and uh, victims, uh, people should be self-realization and self-acquisition uh, uh, of the required uh, uh, competencies so that uh, their character becomes the, the power. Uh, instead of po political power, yeah. their competencies uh, th that brings them power and dignity and respect in the workplace, in the family, in the neighborhood. Uh, that kind of natural processes uh, need to be uh, initiated so that uh, uh, paradigm shift and worldview shift and uh, transformation can be facilitated. I, I think, I believe that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think so. I have two issues, in fact, now to uh, 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 underline from your uh, response. One thing is like in the sense, uh, it's not breaking any endogamy. Like uh, caste itself, in fact, no, uh, uh, anthropologically as shown by Dr. Bedkar as a superimposition of endogamy, endogamy over exogamy. That's the kind of a structure it is. So therefore, like breaking a caste, one of the solutions he was talking about is intercaste marriage or even not marrying within the same kind of a thing which perpetuates the caste system. At the same time, he said uh, it's not it's, it's a medicine, but not the right medicine. It is, in fact, now the uh, caste is a psychology. Basically. That psychology, in fact, now, as uh, so now Dr. Sadaran said, that has to be tackled upon one. Second thing is like in a sense, uh, yes, individuals, in fact, as, as I was talking about in this kind of a talk, in this lecture, I said the system, the Brahminical system or caste system does not respect an individual. 
individual has no position over here no matter whether somebody is intellectual somebody is uh, humane somebody is in fact no broken uh, that particular reason individual doesn't matter here the the kind of a group to which the individual belongs that particular thing decides as human beings as individuals people are good like in a sense as you said there are people who are good actually but the problem is as group how do they react and respond as individuals people are good people are guess something maybe right and uh, like in a sense we may have several friends actually who are really uh, like in a sense uh, uh, who has gone beyond such kind of uh, this thing but as a group they will be forced to behave in such a way that cultural institutions in fact no demand otherwise they themselves will be isolated from their own respective groups so that's the reason is we need to break the structure of the system not uh, otherwise we cannot in fact no operate in between so that is the kind of a, what do you call a requirement to bring in uh, all those uh, human virtues human freedoms human uh, as, as aspirations to get them into a kind of a real practice it is not just individuals who aspire but they need to break down these systems to be able to in fact no enjoy that kind of uh, individual freedoms uh, i think so that's the this you know uh, crux for this society otherwise had there been in fact no a kind of an individual aspiration the system would have been collapsed long ago but why this system has been in fact no uh, thriving for our centuries is because individuals in fact now like in a sense uh, capabilities virtues aspirations they are of no matter uh, in this system it is the group to which you belong that decides whether you should be respected or not otherwise you might be a genius but your respect in fact now it limits only to your group that you belong actually so that's the kind of a system that we are in so the problem is systemic and the system in fact now has to be debased it has to be in fact that's why ambedkar says you will have to apply dynamite to the system in fact no this is values which have been thriving in fact no in the name of religion yeah it is not impossible but it appears tough but not impossible yeah yeah i, I agree sir i agree uh, to expel the darkness we need to introduce the light yes yeah. simply okay. to alternative structures alternative structures instead yes. of uh, yeah, to replace it yeah. yes sir there's Thank a you so much, sir as one sir already ambedkar has given alternative structure alternative way yes, of life yes yes, yes. we have to right. look into that side of that is that's right and especially the constitutional morality you talked about yeah he wanted to bring in that kind of a morality into the lived life yes by rejecting uh, the brahmanical way of life yeah and then in fact no like adopting a democratic way of life yes through in fact no using your mind buddhi yeah, <laughs> yeah. yes so nice meeting you sir thank I, you i i really feel bad that we have not met earlier <laughs> but at least now we have met yes yes i, sir. I, I really uh, so no i'm over oh, so i owe a lot to this particular uh, so arrangement anthropological association for human kind yes. for bringing us together <laughs> yeah yeah and to this talk yeah we are looking forward to bring many more in a natural yes. context like yes, <laughs> that's right yeah. so, so can i retire as you know because i have to pack and then leave tomorrow yes, yes, yes sir please yeah. yeah thank you so much professor satyapal kumar sir for yeah, yes, yes, sir. you don't have to thank you wonderful uh, uh, presentation and uh, no, no, no. very scholarly uh, and uh, you brought a great literature uh, and uh, you brought many things and uh, this is very uh, useful i think so he's gone <laughs> i think so there is an issue from uh, dr pedrataya uh thank you so much friends for your patience and uh, i hope we'll meet again uh, in the next uh, so no talk the title of the talk is ambedkar's anthropocentric uh, religion so i invite you all and we'll be there thank you so much
YouTube, no podría trabajar. ¿no?